Little did we know earlier this year how quickly things would change at the gas pump and just with inflation, which is simply a measurement of how quickly we are paying more for basically everything we buy, setting 40-year records. You see, several months ago when we began to plan out this series, I thought, oh, it's, it's just an aspect of life in how we follow Jesus Little did I know that the special message God had for us was moving from stressful to stress-free. And that's exactly where we find ourselves in the fourth and final week of this series of God inviting you to breathe again in your finances. So for the last three weeks, here's the foundation we've laid. Number one experiencing freedom in your finances begins with contentment. That Bible verse we all love, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, is built on contentment. When you have contentment, what you realize is that that Bible verse promises that God will see you through no matter the circumstances. And then the second week, we talked about how important our integrity is, our, our godliness. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Like if you're running after money, it will take you down a path that later you will regret. But if you begin with integrity, if you begin with your character, then you will have the roadmap that will guide you in how you get and spend your money. And then last week, my, my favorite this story that Jesus told where he pointed to a guy who got fired and then lied, embezzled, stole from his boss. And Jesus said, there's something we need to learn from that guy. Not, not about his character, not about his lying, but he understands how it pays off when you buy friends. Like they can pay you back. And Jesus says, I wish my kids understood how you can buy friends here and they welcome you into heaven forever. And this week, what we're... Nah. Let's let the kids introduce the topic for this week from a video you may have seen on TikTok. Take a look. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one. So then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> All right, so lesson number four that the Lord has for us in finding freedom over our finances and the stress that ties to that is the lesson of delayed gratification. Now, the psychologists have a fun debate. So here's where they take the marshmallow experiment. Some psychologists believe that they can look at our ability or inability to delay gratification as a kid and predict our future. So we'll let the psychologist argue that experiment, and there are psychologists on both sides, but here's what we cannot escape. Your freedom from anxiety around your money is tied directly to your ability to delay gratification. If you've not been able to delay it, you are right now stressed out about your money. 
Don't take my word for it. Let's take a look in God's word as God is inviting us to be free. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, we're headed to Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21. Now, Proverbs are a little bit different in that usually my teachings are pretty easy to anticipate. Like we're going to read a verse or two and I'll talk about it. We'll read a verse or two and I'll talk about it. This time we're kind of jumping around this proverb because proverbs are a string or a collection of wise sayings. They're, they're not like many of the other Bible verses where you just kind of read through. You, you kind of dance back and forth between some related subjects, and so we're going to grab the ones that tie directly to finances. Now, a proverb is a principle, meaning whether you're a person of faith or not, these are principles that you can live by. Like, these are wise sayings. For us, as Christ followers, we know that what Proverbs describes as lady wisdom was personified in the life of Jesus Christ, our Savior. So this is how he lived, and he shows us perfectly in the flesh what this looks like. So here we go, Proverbs 21. I love the opening verse, which isn't exactly about money, but man, oh man, is it a great establishing verse for this conversation. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. The king's heart is a stream in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he will. How encouraging in a season when there are kings in this world, very powerful men, like there's one across the world who is invading a country, and we're like, what? What? And we would not trust him. There are some of us who would say, I don't even trust the kings on this side of the world with how they're managing my money. And yet in the midst of that, we recognize how prone we are to anxiety, concerned about these people who are making financial decisions that are impacting us. And what God wants to say to you is, I turn their hands like streams of water. Trust me. Trust me. Verse 2. Our segue into finances, which says every way of a man is right in his own eyes. Take a big, deep breath, because the moment we start talking about your money is the moment you feel protective, maybe insecure, and definitely defensive about what you've always done. And for us to even have this conversation, we have to first start with this realization, God weighs the heart. Are you willing to have a conversation today about your money in such a way where you would say, God, I may have been taught some things in my family of origin that were not right, but I've just continued down that same path. Or God, I've been doing some things, making a mess, and I've been blaming you. Are you willing to have a conversation about your finances with the Lord in a way that would say, God, show me the ways of my heart. God, show me where I have been defensive and unwilling to take a peek within. Jay Gunn is, is a group's director here on our staff. One of Jay's greatest passions is helping you connect with other people who will take this journey called life together. Some people who are for you, who will pray for you, encourage you, study together, take that journey. Jay loves helping you connect with other people. And very recently, Jay was sharing how he and his wife, Rachel, have been experiencing some, some real freedom in the area of finances. And here's what he shared with our staff. He said, I came to realize that my anxiety around my finances was practical atheism. He said, the stress around my finances was practical atheism. Because what was happening 
is that even though I would claim that God is sovereign and in charge, practically, I was saying to myself, God's not going to help me because I don't deserve it. So it's on me, but I can't do it. So I'm in a mess. Practical atheism. Where has been your practical atheism? Where have you failed to trust God? Where have you failed to take a look at yourself, but instead, it's been right in your own eyes? Will you allow the Lord to invite you into a conversation about something that is very private, very personal, doesn't feel spiritual, and yet it is? Will you invite the Lord into this conversation as we talk about where delayed gratification begins? And the truth is, it begins before you ever get your hands on any money. It happens in both the acquiring and the managing. So let's take a look at four lessons, four discoveries about delayed gratification. First one is in verse 6 and 7. The getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and a snare of death. The violence of the wicked will sweep them away because they refuse to do what is just. The first time you practice delayed gratification is refusing to lie, cheat, steal, or hurt somebody else to get it. There are quick ways to get money. But when you realize that that is a mess, I am not going to hurt somebody else. I am not going to cheat and steal to get money is the first time that you experience the peace that comes with choosing delayed gratification. That is wise for anyone. And for those of us who have accepted Jesus as Savior, for those of us who have come to know him as Savior and we have become his children, it is our identity. We are blameless in God's sight because of the forgiveness we have in Jesus. And so to go down that path of lying or hurting somebody else to get money quick is unthinkable because it's not who we are. But we studied the text just three weeks ago. Many have wandered away from following Jesus because of a love of money. And if we're not aware of it, we will begin to say things like, everybody else, I didn't have a choice. It's just what you got to do in this world. And so in that first step of taking a look at your heart, are you willing to say to the Lord, Jesus, is there anything I've been doing that violates my integrity? Lord, is there anything I've been doing that's shady, opportunistic, or in a willingness to hurt somebody else just to get it quicker? God, show me my heart. Delayed gratification begins with your integrity. Step number two, verse 25 and 26. The desire of a sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. All day long he craves and craves, but the righteous gives and does not hold back. The person who is so obsessed with immediate gratification, can't even put in a full day's work. He or she is so distracted by what they want that they refuse to engage work. There are some really humbling studies out there about worker productivity. It's not just, did you go to work? Though that's a great question. But when you were at work, did you work? Or did you spend your whole day looking, surfing, shopping, thinking, oh, if I could have? The message of God's word is that before we ever get wealth, we are practicing delayed gratification by actually showing up to work and working. Even a couple weeks ago, I said that we, we have 
a wrong view of heaven in mind. For most of us, we've turned it into leisure, like our dream leisure day. But everything that Scripture points to is that our time in heaven will be your dream work day. Adam and Eve, given this command from God, when God said to Adam, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, have dominion, and rule over it. Adam, lead your family to work. And so when we are in the new heaven and the new earth, it will be most like a really fulfilling day. You know that day that you worked hard, and at the end of it, you were exhausted, but you were appreciated, you were productive, you got to do it with other people who love you, and you enjoyed the camaraderie of looking at each other, some high fives, some yes, we did it. That's what it'll be like in the new heaven and the new earth to an entirely new level. Delayed gratification begins with your integrity and hard work. And in that, there is so much fulfillment. We had our elder meeting on Thursday night, and one of our elders, Justin Adams, was talking about a a man he really respects. And one of the things he said about this man was that this man is calling young men to grow up, get a job, and go to work. We need to hear that message. We need to hear that message even though there are seasons when we're unemployed. There are seasons when we're disabled. There are seasons when we're retired. There are seasons when we're at home with the kids. It's not about being outside the home getting a check. What it means is that most of your days should be filled with labor. Most of your days should be filled with activity that is productive as you use your gifts, abilities, opportunities, as you serve in your ministry right where God has placed you, wherever that is. And at the end of the day, you're like, whew, I am exhausted. Thanks be to God. You need a Sabbath. You need a day off. You need a vacation. Those are wonderful things. You need times of leisure and times of restoring. You need the new morning. You need all of that. And you were created to produce and work and labor. It is right. Before you ever acquire wealth, before you ever have it to manage, you prove delayed gratification in both your integrity and your hard work. Lean into that. And enjoy that. Which takes us to verse 13. Whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. All right, so now you have some money. You acquired it with integrity. You acquired it with hard work. Now you have some money. The first step in managing the wealth that God has given you is to give it away. It's like, but Michael, I just got it. Yes. This is the secret. Before it lays hold of you, before it controls you, decide how much of it you're going to give away. Here's the truth found in verse 13. When you refuse to be generous, when you refuse to hear the cry of those who are in need, you close ears to your needs. This was fun when our our study team was working through this text and we realized there's both a horizontal component and a vertical component. So the horizontal applies to everybody. Remember, these are Proverbs, wise sayings to live by. Horizontally, you would say, what goes around comes around. So when you refuse to help people around you, guess what? They return the favor. We don't like being in seasons of need, but guess what? We all find ourselves in seasons of need. And when we have refused to help people in their season of need, they repay us. 
by refusing to help us. Man, you want to be generous when you can because there'll be a time you need others to be generous with you. And then, for those of us who are people of faith, who have trusted in Jesus, there is absolutely a vertical component. James 4, verse 3. So this is the half-brother of Jesus who writes, you pray and God does not answer your prayer because all you're going to do it is burn it on you. You pray, you ask God for more, and he says, no way, because your prayers are incessantly desirous for you. Jesus takes it to a whole new level. He says, if you refuse to be generous, you prove you're not one of my kids. Really? Read it today. Matthew chapter 25, you might know of it as the parable of the sheep and the goats. Jesus says, whatever you've done to the least of these, people who had no clothing, no food, no shelter, those who were truly in need, Jesus says, whatever you did to them and for them, it's like you did it for me. Well done. But for those of you who saw people in need, clothes, food, shelter, daily necessities, and you didn't help them, it's like you rejected me. For us to be unwilling to be generous, for us to find it easy to turn away from somebody who is in need proves that we're not following Jesus. Here's why. To accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord is to accept the most generous gift humanity has ever been given. It is so generous that it's confusing. Like, how could God? How could God become one of us? How could God be willing to leave the throne and take on flesh and live an entire life? How could God be willing to subject himself to crucifixion? How could God be willing to get his hands dirty to take care of our sins? How could God love us that much? It's mind-boggling. The gospel message that God loves you so much, though he knew you got yourself lost and could not get yourself saved, he so wanted you that he came and saved you. It's scandalous. To say, I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, come human. I believe that Jesus died in my place. To say, I confess with my mouth a belief from my heart that Jesus died for me and I am saved through him. To accept the greatest gift is also to accept the greatest responsibility to be generous. Those who are forgiven, forgive. Those who have received generously, give generously. It's unthinkable that we would not because it reveals our identity. But you say, Michael, it's it's not that I don't care. I just can't. It's not that I don't care about people in need. It's not that I don't want to give to those things. I just just can't. And you're right. There are seasons when we can't. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians and he said, there was a time you you couldn't. And now you've, you've gotten back. There are seasons when we can't. But it cannot be the story of our lives. You see, when inflation hits 40 years high and gas prices nudge toward $5, it is easy to feel like we can't. And yet, in perspective, we have so much. A few weeks ago, 
I quoted When Helping Hurts, one of our favorite books around Cornerstone because we love helping people in a way that actually helps. So if you're trying to figure out how to help people in your life without hurting them, read the book, When Helping Hurts, or get in on one of our groups who are. And they quote some old numbers in that book back when one-third of the world's population made $2 a day or less, and back then the average American made 90 Two compared to 90. So this week I, I got some newer numbers. This one is per capita median income. It's just a couple years old. The average per capita median income in the United States of America a couple years ago was $56,000 and change. So per year, if you take the dude in the middle, take out the wealthiest, take out the poorest, and take the middle income in the United States of America, one person working, $56,000. You're undoubtedly not the middle person in the world, so yours is a little bit different from that or maybe quite a bit. But the other numbers are there to help you put things in perspective. Because whether you live in the United States, Israel, Mexico, China, or Haiti, the command from God to followers of Jesus is to be generous. Generosity is not doling out what you have left over. Generosity is choosing to give from that which is yours. And in Scripture, generosity is determined in the first move you make with your money. First move. The Bible calls it first fruits. You choose your level of generosity in your first spending after you get more money. Because right then is when you decide, how much of what I have am I going to give away? Generosity is not doling out what's left over. It starts off the top. One of the ways that it's helpful to kind of reset your brain is not How much of what I have am I going to give away? Instead, go this direction. How much of this am I going to keep for myself? 100%? Oh, I don't know. 99? Like, what's your number? What's your number? Because you make a decision the first time you let go of some money, your level of generosity. Giving is number three in how we delay gratification. We give it away and delay our gratification to spend our money on our own. What's your number? What's your amount? Decide before you spend anything on you. But it's it's not just giving. There's another piece of delayed gratification. You find it in verse 20. This one's a little surprising at first. Precious treasure and oil are in the wise man's dwelling. Not the rich man's dwelling. The wise man's dwelling. But a foolish man devours it. Not the poor man. The foolish man. What are treasure and oil? Valuable commodities. Uh, Treasure might be gold, a coin, But it's something that holds wealth. Uh, What is oil? Same kind of thing. It's something you can hang on to for a while without it going bad. And so in both of these, we find the fourth step in delaying our gratification, which is saving. Saving. This is a lost art in the United States of America. The average American does not have enough cash on hand to take care of a minor emergency, such as the fridge going out or tires going bald. And the funny thing is, those aren't even emergencies. Those are maintenance. Those are things that happen every so many months or years. You can plan for it based on how many miles you drive or what kind of refrigerator you bought. Like, you know it's coming. 
But the average American does not have the thousand bucks it would take to put tires or refrigerator or whatever your maintenance or small emergency might be. And so when a real emergency happens, think global pandemic, Americans are now seasoned enough that we expect the government to start handing out cash. Now, there are many of you who are not comfortable with the way the government has been handing out cash. But the majority of Americans believe the government should. Because we spend every dollar we get. And by some measurements, we spend more than we make. So what is the path to managing your money with delayed gratification? It's pretty simple. Give, save, and then spend. And the fun thing about spending is that you get to spend it however you want. You get to experience the joy of your heavenly father that enjoys, as a good father does, watching you spend your money. He loves watching if you're going to buy the blue one or the red one. Get a nicer car or have a nicer vacation. He loves it. He has poured out these blessings to the tune of an average of $56,000 per year and loves to see us enjoy it as long as it does not own us. We Americans have it backwards. We spend it. And if we have any left over, we save it. And if we have any left over, we give it. And you know how that works out. Because we spend it and feel like we had to have, needed to have, deserved to have whatever we spent it on. But if you'll just flip the equation over, you will find yourself free. Free. What's your starting point? The pattern of Scripture is that we give first. The Bible calls it first fruits. In the Old Testament, there's a word called tithe, which means first tenth. It was the foundational giving portion that God's people gave to God. They gave it at the temple 10% off the top. The secret is give first. What's your number? How much of yours are you willing or comfortable to keep for yourself? Whatever you're not comfortable keeping for yourself, give it away. Give it away. And be free from the stress that comes with spending first. One of the sad mistakes that I've heard many Christians make is to just kind of flippantly kick tithing or first fruits to the curb. Ah, that, that's, that's Old Testament law. That doesn't apply anymore. Sometimes that's right. Sometimes that's wrong. You have to understand what law was it? What kind of law was it in the Old Testament? Some of them are gone. You're absolutely right. The civil laws, like what it meant to be an Israelite, they're, those are gone. We're Americans. The ceremonial laws, you're absolutely right. Book of Leviticus, don't keep any of those laws because Jesus kept them perfectly for you. Those are the ceremonial laws. But then also in the Old Testament, you see the moral laws. And rather than kicking those out, Jesus took those to a whole new level. Jesus says, look it up, Matthew 5. Jesus said, you've heard it said before, don't murder. I'm telling you, don't hate. You've heard it said before, don't commit adultery. I'm telling you, don't lust. You've heard it said before, be careful on the oaths you make. I'm telling you, just let your yes be yes and no be no. Jesus took the moral laws and shoved them to a higher level in the gospel. So when it comes to first fruits or First tenth, the pattern in the New Testament shows the believers back then took it to a whole new level. Like they're selling their possessions to make sure nobody had need of it, not just tithing. They're giving out of their poverty, not just when they had it to give. 
The pattern in Scripture, as we look in the New Testament, is not a dismissal of tithing. It's way more than tithing. Be careful. In Christ, you are free from the law. Just make you sure you haven't been flippant with biblical principles Jesus fulfilled and then even multiplied. And for those of you who have, who have practiced tithing, for those of you who give first, and at least part of your giving is here at Cornerstone, let, let me say thank you. We, we live in a world that that's, that's kind of hard, and that's been a lost discipline. A discipline I was taught as a child, but for many of us, we weren't. Because of your partnership, we are getting to bless a lot of people. 15 years ago, 3% of our budget was given away, like to missionaries and church planting and other organizations. Over the last 15 years, we've more than tripled that. And now, with our regular budget giving and renews giving and some extra funds the Lord has blessed us with, this year, we're on pace to give, over, give away over a half million dollars. Half million dollars. Because of you. Because of you. Be, because we recognize that God has blessed us. And you've disciplined yourselves. And you've given off the top. And we're partnering in ministry. So missionaries are being sent. And churches are being planted and ministries you love in this region are being blessed because together we're doing that but if you're not in that crowd if you're in a place where you would say Michael I sure hope you don't know what I give because I'd be really embarrassed if you knew that number I don't know your number but I do know there's hope let me show you Chris and Laura's number just a few years ago Chris and Laura we're over $300,000 in debt. Think credit cards, personal loan, uh, doctor bills, a van that wasn't worth what they owed on it. Four years, they got rid of $300,000 worth of that kind of debt. And now they are free. So free. They can choose the job that fits their gifts and personalities. So free that the business that they own does not own them. And Chris takes his kids to school every day. He is now free to be the man that God called him to be. He is now free as a member of our finance team to take the journey with people like you who are sick and tired of being sick and tired and stressed out about your money. What if Chris and Laura's story becomes your story over the next few years? What if the story of Cornerstone over the last 15 becomes your personal story of generosity and giving? It doesn't happen overnight, but you sure don't need to give up tonight. Because of the gospel of Jesus, we give because we have first received. And my, oh my, what a beautiful day it is when the Lord sets us free from the stress that comes with that weight of finances that are really broken. What if the Lord would set you free today on a new journey of discovering life to the fullest? Let me pray. I believe he will. God, thank you for this little journey we've been on over the last few weeks. And thank you for an opportunity to have a conversation open-handed, not, not excusing what we've always done, not being defensive about who got us there, but instead discovering a message from you inviting us to be free. Oh God, I, I thank you for what you have done 
through our church. Lord, I, I thank you for the incredible resources that we as a body have together to share. Lord, I thank you for that incredible privilege that we have to bless others right here and across the world. Lord, thank you that together we get to do something really special. And Lord, I thank you for the future that you have for each of our people, our families. God, I thank you for the future that you have for them, a future that for many of us we don't even believe is possible yet. God, I do pray to your glory that you would loosen the stranglehold that the enemy has had around many of our financial throats. God, I pray that you would loosen us from the shame that many of us have felt. We're not even open in the statements anymore. We are so afraid to see that number. God, may you set your people free to discover the life that you made available through Jesus. Lord, that we would experience the generosity of the gospel in such a way that it compels us to be generous. Lord, set us free and set us on this path of discovering the blessing that we experience as we walk according to your word. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your willingness to sacrifice on our behalf that we might be able to to be set free. So it is to your glory that we stand in the truth of your word and in the hope of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray.